imagine a hypothetical world where everyone is dumb not able to speak anything with no written literature or language how will you be even able to convey your message in such a scenario the difficulties while communicating would shoot up to the sky with a tremendous amount of energy loss in trying different methods there was a time when we used to train pigeons and send them across provinces to convey the messages and i remember even as kids we used to make cups through which the pressure waves used to travel along the strings between the cups and if you see now the communication is so easily manifested using satellites i came across a quote which goes in this way that the art of communication is the language of leadership a very happy evening to one and all present here i am devinder currently pursuing btech in aerospace engineering would welcome you all on the fifth day of outreach program and also want to give tons of wishes on the occasion of the sera festival i hope you all are enjoying we also have namana siriam gowda as the co-host who will be joining us at the end of this session at ssrd we offer online courses workshops projects and internships on wide range of topics related to space astronomy and aerospace sectors for more information please check out our official website the sponsors collaborating with us are genex space and the space do you guys remember the point that i mentioned last time that humans never stop to evolve and so is apt in the case of communication as well which we can rightly see the use of technology such as smartphones during the pandemic time and today it needs to be a blast as when i calculated the total sum came to be equal to the outreach program plus the festival so let us now ignite our minds and the crackers if you have with picking up the bags of eagerness on the space mission with some good amount of boosters at the back as we have approached the realm of satellites to know its past present and future today on the panel we have arvind ravichandran who is the director of space strategy at tomorrow.io and writer and podcaster at terra watch space and we also have space imaging team leader at egyptian space agency dr ayman ahmed who will be sharing his views and thoughts with us now i would like to introduce the moderator arun arun is a young professional worker in the space industry he is also he is associated as a core member of a leading space tech startup in india and his areas of interest include upstream sector strategy policy and market dynamics presently he is undertaking research work investigating the geological aspects of space diplomacy and the privatization of the sector he has been invited to present his views on space exploration at several international forums and is a recipient of india's top presidential awards for creativity in scientific innovation seems like we have not two but three speakers on the dais not just this he is an amateur astronomer a science communicator and consultant arun is also closely associated with the global himalayan expedition in ladakh india where he promoted astro tourism through various training activities and modules his passion for space comes from years of interactions with the public through astronomy outreach i am very very glad to greet him as the moderator for today's session now i request arun to take over the meet and and introduce the speakers for the day arun over to you well thank you thank you for such a warm introduction <laughs> and uh, and good evening everyone so um <laughs> so i've been told that uh, i've now now before i begin uh, like i've been given this very long script about the two speakers who are on stage with us and i must say it's a very big and a very rather impressive list of achievements so with dr ahmed who is uh, joining us from egypt and uh, mr arvind ravichandran from france we literally have uh, the whole world with us so so as per the you know introduction given about dr ahmed he has uh, been uh, 
take, he has uh, taken up about 28 types of uh, different works in various magazines and publications. He has a PhD in uh, you know, satellite uh, imaging engineering, and he's been doing a lot of amazing work with hyperspectral space imaging devices, the use of artificial intelligence system, and so many things. So literally, we have an Egyptian hero with us. And uh, talking about Mr. Uh, Aravind Ravichandran, he's an amazing uh, podcaster. And I recommend anybody who is uh, trying to gain insights about the space industry, uh, look into his podcast, TerraWatch. He's a software engineer turned uh, in industry professional. So you can uh, kind of understand where he comes from. So having seen the promise of new technologies and the revolution that the space industry is bringing, uh, you know, there's so much uh, looking to look forward to in this session. So, um, yeah, I uh, welcome Dr. Uh, I welcome uh, Aravind Ravichandran to take the stage and uh, let's, uh, you know, wait for a cracking session. So over to you, Aravind. Thank you for uh, accepting the invite and uh, joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aravind. Thank you, everyone, for having me. And it's, it's such a pleasure to be on. And uh, to be talking about space and satellites. Uh, as you might imagine, uh, you might imagine I moved into the space industry five years ago to, you know, to work on, well, anything space, really. Um, so, you know, it's glad to be part of the session where I can talk about uh, some of the work that I've been doing and also some of the insights that I can share. Um, could you tell me if you can see my screen? Uh, just give me one moment. The presentation? Um, not yet. Yes. Uh, can you see it? Yeah, I'm able yep. to share only full screen. So hopefully um, you don't see other things. <laughs> uh, you see the presentation only. Can you see it in full screen? Yes. Yes, yes. Cool. Uh, so let me quickly introduce myself and then I'll get into the presentation. So the, the topic of the session is what is the past, present and future of satellites, right? So um, I'll, I'll start with a quick introduction about myself. So I come from India. Uh, I come from Chennai. And I used to work in software, like you mentioned, for uh, a few years at Amazon, actually, uh, as a software engineer. And then I moved to Europe. I continued working in software on the business side of things. And then five years ago, 2016, I, I decided to move into the space industry simply because at that point, 2016 was the year when the Falcon 9 was the first, you know, the first reuse of the first stage of the Falcon 9 happened. Uh, and I also got to know because I was in Europe a lot about the Sentinel mission. Sentinel is a satellite program, Copernicus is the name of the program from Europe. Um, that has um, a lot of satellites up now, um, I believe eight, nine of them uh, collecting different types of data about the Earth. And I was just fascinated about everything that we can do with uh, satellites for Earth. Um, obviously, when I got into the space industry, you know, all my fascination was about Mars and Moon and living outside um, Earth. But then, you know, what I became passionate about was the role of satellites and what they play. And I'm sure a lot of people here would probably are aware of what I'm going to present and what I'm going to talk about. But I think it's important to understand because um, part of my job is, um, you know, talking about my role. But what I've been doing is also, you know, trying to demystify space for those what I call outside the space bubble. So a space bubble is basically people within the space industry. Well, I don't fall into that because I come from the outside. But there are, uh, you know, a lot of them in the space industry, you know, have been working in space for all their life and obviously you know they have done incredible stuff but i think it's also important to transfer that to to people outside uh, the industry and especially at a time where we are living now where you know you've you've all seen the space tours and missions and all the coverage that has got uh, good and bad right like there are it has gotten a lot of people to even speak about you know why do we need to invest in space there's a lot of problems on earth but satellites are the answer for that right like the satellites are basically, you know, well, we did that serendipitously, you know, 1950s when we sent the Sputnik up and then the first weather satellite up, we didn't know what the potential of space was and satellites really turned, uh, you know, the use of space for Earth. So uh, it's glad to be, you know, talking about satellites during this session. Um, I, I quickly introduced myself. So I started out in software, like I mentioned, and then I moved to space 
where I worked in strategy consulting. Um, so I worked uh, at PwC and I worked on a number of projects for the European Space Agency, European Commission, uh, a lot of space companies advising on their strategy and go to market, uh, doing some market analysis, research, etc. Um, currently, I'm the director of strategy at uh, Tomorrow. Tomorrow is a weather intelligence company. Uh, we are launching a, a constellation of weather satellites next year. Um, I've been in India and I know about how um, you know the weather in different parts of the world are not exactly the way it should be, and in 20, even in 2021. Uh, so that's kind of what we're working on changing to have uh you know accurate weather insights all around the world because in the west and like europe and asia uh, sorry europe and us the satellites uh sorry the weather is quite accurate more accurate than you would imagine in different parts of asia africa and latin america and in 2021 it shouldn't be the case right like it should be just like how people are talking about internet access should be like a right i think weather insight should also be a right especially as we are approaching a time of climate change where there's going to be a lot of extreme weather events. So uh, that's what my company does. And I'm, I, I joined them just a couple of months ago uh, because I found their mission to be very impactful and fascinating. Right. Let's get into um, satellites and space, right? So we've all been looking up to space for inspiration. That's kind of how a lot of people get into the space industry um, about this fascination. Either we have seen these pictures that the Hubble to Space Telescope took like this one that you see on the screen or it can be um, you know it can be mars it can be moon it can be saturn it can be pluto for me pluto played a big part because 2015 was new horizons and i just couldn't imagine that uh, that was possible so that was kind of one of the catalysts for me to get into the space industry was because we have a picture of pluto now and it happened in 2015 right so that's what pushed me to you know get into the space industry but then you know we can also look down upon Earth from space for insights, right? So there's a lot of things that we can do from space that we haven't even started to realize yet, but some we've already started to realize. Um, so this is a picture. Um, it's not one picture. It's it's a bunch of pictures that were put together uh, by by a NASA satellite that takes nighttime imagery. Um, and it's, it's a little dated, maybe it's not going to be up to date, but uh, what you can see is already some insights, right? Like where do people live? Uh, well, clearly in India, we live everywhere. <laughs> um, but, you know, you see parts of uh, China, you see parts of Africa, you see parts of Australia. Well, Australia is pretty empty, right? Like you wouldn't imagine. So it gives you different perspectives and it just doesn't make you see. But these are the kind of images that are being used by International Monetary Fund, the IMF, the World Bank. Uh, the Asian Development Bank. I have been involved in projects with the World Bank where they use data like this to identify which part of the world is, uh, uh, you know, impacted economically because of COVID, um, which parts of the world have been improving and developing over the last few decades because electrification sometimes is correlated with uh, economic activity. Um, and you would see a lot of that happening in the next few years. So space allows you to do that. And talking about space, satellites allow you to do that, right? Um, I always like to start with this when I talk about satellites to people. It's, um, this, is not from, this is not a satellite image, but then it gives you a perspective, right? This was a mission that was, um, uh, this was uh, Apollo 13, if I'm not mistaken, sorry, Apollo, Apollo 10, if I'm not mistaken, uh, before, the, um, before the, you know, the moon landing mission where they were you know, scanning for uh, landing spots on the moon. And this was a picture that was taken by an astronaut uh, uh, of the Earth. And this was one of the first pictures that was taken um, of, of the Earth. And it's called the Earth Rise. I'm sure many of you have seen that. And I, I love to see that because it also always put things, puts things in perspective. And that's exactly what, you know, satellites allow you to do that. Apollo 8, I was mistaken, sorry. And this was taken by uh, the astronaut um who mentioned that he we set out to explore the moon and instead discovered the earth and for me i found find this quote always fascinating because that's what usually space exploration comes down to is you always keep you know looking the other way and then sometimes you just need to look back um so we started sending satellites and laboratories up there so of course hundreds of satellites well thousands of satellites now uh commercial uh age of space is here there's a bunch of companies uh, having satellites up there and then there's uh, laboratories up there, the ISS. Um, so we started sending you know, all of those out because the, the picture that we saw before created or 
was part of uh, an environmental movement around the world, right? Like people just saw the the you know the small um, planet just hanging in there, and they just realized that um, you know we need to understand it better and take care of it better, which is why we started sending the satellites up, right? And that's why all of the satellites that we have up there is for understanding what's going on in our planet and what we are doing to it. Those are the two th two main things that we're trying to understand about um, about from satellites. What what's happening to our planet? Can we you know understand it better? And can we understand our activities there better? So we started sending satellites, laboratories, and a Tesla, right? Because why not? Um, today we have more than seven hundred uh, of the satellites. This is this number keeps improve, increasing every day. This is probably even wrong um because every day there's a lot of operational satellites out there and just to give you a sense of how many companies are out there that are uh, having satellites up there this is just one part of satellites right like i'm just focusing on earth observation um what are the types of sensors you can have sensors that are just looking at the infrared which is good for you know scanning wildfires wildfires are becoming more and more common uh, infrared is also very critical for monitoring soil moisture. If you're on the agricultural fields, uh, too, to identify because soil moisture is an important part of uh, predicting how a plant is going to grow and how much yield is going to have. You're going to get. Um, optical again is is pretty obvious. That's basically the optical picture, the picture that we can understand. Uh, pictures like I'm going to show in a couple of minutes. Um, but then there's also you no know, radar sensors. So the company that I work for tomorrow, we're going to send radar sensors. So radar is taking a, it doesn't take a picture of the Earth, but it rather sends a signal down and then it bounces back. So with that, you can understand clouds. You can understand how much rainfall is falling down. That's what we aim to do. We want to find out how much rainfall is falling over an area so that we can predict how much it's going to be in the future. And that's a variable that has been missing in the past. So that's what we aim to do. So different types of sensors, you know, I'm not going to get into that because it's going to be a course. Satellites are a specific course. Earth observation satellites are a course by itself, right? So there are, you know, the bottom line is there are so many types of satellites up there that are collecting different types of data about the Earth for different purposes. And of course, they allow us to you know, observe things in high definition, right? Like we're talking about 30 centimeter resolution now. So every, you know, pixel in this picture is 30 centimeter, which means that you can start counting containers in ports, um, which is great, especially we saw the impact last year. And I was personally involved in a couple of projects where uh, countries and, you know, companies were involved in counting the number of, you know, containers that are being transported from, you know, port to port around the world to see what is the impact of COVID. Suddenly, you know, you saw all these graphs that had like, you know, dip of activity last year. And part of that was due to satellite images. People don't see and connect the dots of how this happens, but it's all, you know, also due to satellite images and satellites play a, a huge part there. So, you know, observing the earth. Um, and I love this picture simply because it's, it's a picture of uh, Barcelona, a town in Barcelona. And I have walked through these streets and I know how the urban planning has been done. So just look at the urban planning on this picture of how every you know community is organized. And we can learn a lot about how we want to organize our cities by looking at different parts of the world in different perspectives, especially if you're trying to move towards a world with uh, less pollution, you know, a lot more space, a lot more trees. Um, I think we can it helps us understand from a different perspective so i love to see pictures from above uh satellite pictures of different parts of the world simply to understand them better sometimes you can see a lot more looking you know top down instead of you know horizontally when you're walking on the street um and also it helps us observe changes in time right like i don't know how many of you remember but a couple of years ago um uh, chennai where i come from we ran out of water uh and it helped, uh, well, satellite pictures, of course, track that, but it don't, not only did that, but also helped understand why. Um, and part of the reason why was because there's a lot of development that was going on in this area in terms of, you know, cutting down trees and, you know, uh, impacting the soil that, you know, the water just dried out in terms of the water table under the soil. So unfortunately, uh, you know, we, we ran out of water back home. And I remember how it was a couple of years ago when I was speaking with my family. Uh, but satellites help us understand, not only just take pictures of, you know, there was no water, but also helps us understand why. Because 
you know, even I personally looked into images of Chennai from 2018 to 2019. And, you know, even back satellites allow you to do that, right? Like you can actually go back in time to identify what really happened in this area. And that's kind of how they figured out that there's a lot of soil erosion and uh, well, lack of rainfall was also a reason. But then you can also, you know, go back to lack of rainfall with satellites, uh, with weather satellites and observe what's going to happen to to the city in terms of its uh, future of weather. Um, and also, you know, observe changes over time. So this is kind of a, a sad video. I don't know if you can see the video, but it's kind of a sad video because you see hundreds of acres of trees being cut in the video over the course of a few months. And yeah, satellites help you track that, which is which is very unfortunate, but at least it's visual. Human beings are very visual. If you read a news saying hundreds of acres of trees are being cut, you might be, you know, uh, you might understand it. Some people might not understand it because it's just numbers and, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, scaremongering and people are just spreading messages and there's no proof for it. But if you show visuals, it's a lot more impactful. And um, this is from a company called Planet and I'll talk about them in a bit. But they, their images are great because they have everyday images and you can track changes over time. And, you know, you see again um, the the trees disappearing over just a course of a few months it's it's impactful and it makes you want to do something right so that's that's the power of visuals really uh, and of course it helps you experience the beautiful i'm not going to go into that because i'm sure you've seen a bunch of satellite pictures which are um, amazing to look at uh, just from you know helps you get a perspective of the world without really going to space hopefully you can get to space at some point but you can get a perspective of them and of course, it helps you track the not very beautiful because one of the types of satellites we can send up there is um, is a spectrometer. So you can put a spectrometer in a satellite and track, uh, you know, the part of the spectrum that has to do with methane, and that's done by a company called GSG Sat, who are doing that to track emissions around the world. As we move into a world where we have to reduce our emissions, it becomes very important to track where the emissions come from. You know, and what satellites do is objectivity. You cannot lie. You cannot say you do not emit. And that's what I love about satellites because, yeah, there, it gives you a neutral perspective. You know, it cannot uh, give you data that is not true, you know. So that that's going to become more and more important in the next few years as some countries look at reducing the emissions. And we saw that during COVID of how, you know, the entire world, uh, the emissions was just reduced over a course of a month. And um and hopefully we can get to do that more and you know satellites help us give us the perspective and you know satellites this is more the present i want to call it the future but it's more the present satellites are already becoming smaller and smaller this used to be the size of a satellite uh, it's the sentinel 5p satellite which was taking pictures of the image that you saw before about the emission so this used to be the size of a satellite right like a mini bus it's huge but then it started becoming very, very small. So this is, a, this is a satellite now of a company called Planet. So Planet was the was the image that you saw before about the you know the rainforest getting destroyed. It was taken by a satellite like that. So you know it's becoming really, really small. That's the size of their satellite called Doves, um, and you know they have launched a constellation of satellites. So hundreds of satellites in space um, to help us track the planet and you know take pictures of what's going on in our planet. Um, and I call this the iPhone moment for satellite data. And I call this the iPhone moment because in 2007, when the iPhone was released, nobody had any clue about what was going with the app economy, right? Like people were, of course, fascinated with the phone. It had a touch screen and everything was great. But then when Apple launched the app store just a few months later, people started developing their own apps. And now it started becoming a whole economy by itself which is one of the biggest companies in the world, Uber. What does it have? An app. Uh, another company. I mean, there are case studies from India today. There are so many companies that are just app companies, right? Like you wouldn't have thought 10 years ago that it would have been a company. And I think that that's going to be the same case. And what I find interesting with the iPhone moment is people just didn't you know, develop apps for using one technology, which is the phone, but they also integrated other things. So what happens if you include location, GPS, and contacts and uh you know payment all of that put together you know kind of became uh, ride sharing apps right so you can combine different sources of data to create a new application and i think that's what is going to happen with 
satellite images and satellite data, because there's going to be applications across different sectors, um, depending on whatever satellite we're looking at. You know, I showed you an example of emissions. I showed you an example of um, uh, deforestation. There's just so many examples, and I'm going to look into a couple of examples here. So retail, this was used a lot uh, during the pandemic to identify if the world is back to normal. Some parts of the world are back to normal. I live in France. We are almost back to normal. And part of the ways today companies use that is, is using, you know, data from GPS satellites, uh, from, from, um, from Earth observation satellites to take a picture of this, is like, uh, you know, parking lot of, uh, of a supermarket to, you know, to compare and see if life is back to normal. And you can do that with AI today. You don't have to sit and count the number of cars, right? You can, you can train an algorithm to do that. So that's, you know, that's where I, I talk about going back to the iPhone moment. You know, you wouldn't have thought AI and satellites and images, all of them come together, but that's kind of what's happening now. And it's, it was helpful during Lebanon. I don't know how many of you remember last year, there was a huge explosion in Lebanon, I'm sure. Um, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of you remember this this news that uh, there was a huge explosion. So insurance companies were very involved in using satellite images because you can track, you know, what are the buildings that were affected in order to claim insurance. So again, insurance is a completely different sector, but satellites have a role to play in there as well. Um, and finally, I want to touch on what we do at Tomorrow as well. So obviously, this is um, a screenshot from our platform of what we do and how we operate. So this is a picture of a cyclone. So we don't have satellites today, but we're using data from the publicly available satellites uh, around the world. Um, so what's important is, you know, not just taking pictures, right? Like, okay, there's a storm coming, but we need to answer the question of so what? So I think the future is going to be of, People trying to answer not only just you know using satellites to make pictures, but then also trying to do uh, make make action based on what we see. So if there's a storm coming, what you can do is you can warn people, hey, there's going to be high winds, so there's going to be a risk to your rail. So don't run the trains between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. Uh, you know, run um, run your solar panel uh, activity between this time and this time because the activity of the sun is very, very big. You know, these are all insights that people want to know. And that's kind of what we provide it um, at tomorrow. And that's that's kind of what I want to leave you all with is there's, there's, a, there's a gap that satellite data can fill. So, you know, I touched on methane. You can do, you can have, you know, sensors around the world to track emissions and air quality, but satellites can do that better. You can have, again, for weather, you can have sensors everywhere in the world, but satellites can do that better. And that's what we are trying to do, right? So the idea is to imagine that satellites are just one part of the puzzle, but then there are also other parts of the puzzle that are important. It can be economic activity, it can be other types of data from drones and IoT, whatever it is. And that's what will lead us to new insights. Uh, and the future of satellites is also all about the same technologies we talk about every day, cloud. So every satellite image is gigabytes to store. You can't store that normally, and you can't definitely process that in your computer. You need the cloud, and we are taking cloud to space. So satellites and cloud are gonna become the same thing. Uh, and we are also taking AI to space. So instead of taking the image down and processing it in a computer on Earth, we are trying to do that in space now. There are a couple of companies and uh, you know space agency missions that are looking into processing images in space so that when the data comes down it's already an insight you don't have to you know uh, count the number of cars on earth you can just do that in space and just get the data down so that you can use it for your own applications and data fusion data fusion is something that i talked about here about satellite cannot be the only answer you need to fuse that with other types of data um, and that's that's basically going to be the future of satellites you know putting everything that we know on earth you know up onto space because now space allows you to do that because every uh, all the costs are coming down so i'll stop there i don't know if um if this made sense um trying to stop sharing yeah i don't know if that made sense but uh basically that's um that's my presentation yeah thank you for such an amazing presentation and uh, you said does it make sense well i think it makes sense to a lot of the critics who keep questioning the relevance of satellites in our daily lives because they see another satellite being launched and people complain that you know you're a poor country why do you want to 
you know, you launch another satellite when so many people are suffering. But as you had mentioned, uh, when cyclones were coming in, we use satellites to track the damage beforehand and evacuate people or, you know, save properties. So this is perfect, I, I would say. And uh, for our next speaker, so Dr. Ahmed, the stage is all yours. Welcome. Um, sorry, sir, your mic is on mute. Hello? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Uh, I yes. hope you can see my screen now. Yep. Thank you for inviting me today. Uh, um, I enjoyed my um, the last presentation. Uh, it was very good, actually, and I have been inspired by it. Okay, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Ayman Ahmed, and um, I have a PhD in uh, space uh, and satellite imaging systems, uh, and I'm working at the European Space Agency. And recently, uh, recently I have been uh, nominated for the project manager for the first payload of the Moon Village Association, and it is a, a first uh, payload project to develop a camera that can be uh, mounted on the lunar surface for taking um, a live stream for the Earth. So uh, I'm going to start my presentation by having um, uh, yes uh, okay uh, a satellite. What is a satellite? I think all of us know what is a satellite. But what is most important here to know the first human who thought to launch a satellite. Uh, so this date actually is a very uh, inspiring date. Uh, we are now 65 years in space. So the humankind spent 65 years in space. And I, I don't think that uh, having um, thought about launching a small body of metal in space, uh, that will lead us to these applications today. So the humankind is being uh, exploring everything. Um, and uh, I think the idea itself is being to uh, emerge and to explode uh and to have something which have been never expected before but i think science fiction is very good and very inspiring especially when you, when you read stories about uh going under the ground going going out of the space so uh, i'm going to speak actually about the the uh the technology part of the satellite how satellites is going to be developed how it is already developed what is the future for the developing a satellite. But the most important, where we put the satellite, satellite is usually put at the forest altitude, which is uh, behind 500 um, kilometers above the Earth. And as you can see, there is a lot of uh, atmospheric layers, troposphere, stratosphere, and the mesosphere. All of these have a lot of kind of application, but the satellites actually is the most inspiring and most kind of applications that can be sensed by a human life day. But let us speak about the, um, the inspiration of having something in space. Uh, nowadays, we have something which is a device which is operating in a space. Um, when the humankind thought about this, they never thought they, they are going to, to use the satellite in many applications especially in Earth observation, communication, navigation, weather research. So these ideas came from nowhere. It came from just putting a device in space. 65 years ago, this humankind made the first step, and now we are reaching a lot of applications, and we are going beyond these applications in many, many um, other applications in just a few years. But we have to say, what is a satellite subsystem? What is the composition of satellite? Satellite usually is composed of many subsystems which are interconnected together to be operable in a space. So we have a power system which usually gathers the power from the solar cell and solar sun and solar energy. Then we have the thermal control. As we, we all know that the space is very cold. Cold of the space required a lot of energy to stabilize the operation of its subsystems. We have the telemetry system, which usually sends the signals to the ground station to know what is the satellite system now, what is the operational um, modes, what is the damage.
that can be done on the satellite. We have finally the attitude determination and the control subsystem slide toward a specific direction. There is a lot of engineering functions that can be developed for a satellite platform. Actually, this is a complicated prob problem, and a lot of engineering and uh, researchers work to simplify this issue. Having simplification of this, need to do we really need this? Do we really need to invest in space? And I think the first and most important uh, part of the applications for the satellite is the climate change. Is a lot of damage in the human planets, the environment, the uh, the life. But we have to to face this one, and we have to more make more investment in the space technology and applications. So, do we really need to uh, take an interest for uh, satellite to? Have Yes, we have to do it. And we have to orient our application, especially to change. So uh, having some sort of investment in space and satellite technology uh, is trying to compromise between how do we have uh, expensive uh, satellite and space technology, and do we rely on this technology to solve our problem, especially like environmental and, and the climate problem? Yes, we have to do this. In order to do this, this we have to find an intermediate solution. This intermediate can uh, um, should be should be an affordable and affordability and sustainability actually is a very good and very uh, sensitive solution to have um, uh, uh, satellite systems operational in space. And this this service should be uh, affordable by either emerging space country and faring space faring countries as well as developing space country. So if we take a look for our planet Earth, we can find a lot of emerging. If you can see here, we have small satellite numbers. This is uh, in the 60s. Then we can have an incremental objects around the Earth. Objects is increasing in number. And if we can see how these things are increasing and how the space is being occupied by many, many satellites orbiting the Earth, we can see how this, this investment is being very large nowadays. So we, as you can see, there are a lot of uh, objects here. But the issue is, do we have to face the, what we can call the space debris problem? Yes, we have. Because once the is orbiting the space, it is orbiting for space forever. And say, until she has been uh, aided in altitude to be burned, or it can be taken from the, its orbit to the space garbage uh, place. So, in any way, face ourselves was with the situation that we have a lot of satellites orbiting the Earth, and we have also to deal with the problem of space debris. Space debris is a serious one, and I think if you have watched the movie, the gravity. You can see how the space debris can be damaged for the um, assets, space assets, which is very uh, expensive one. Uh, we can see uh, how this uh, is being crowded now. So I think as a humankind, we have already thought how we can move forward with uh, this a lot of uh, satellite orbiting and also the objects around the Earth. And nowadays, they have been a lot of announcement from uh, many space countries that they are going to have a moon mission. So I think the next step for the human is going to the moon. Having uh, a mission to the moon, yes, we have the Apollo missions, but it is not only the missions that we can rely on because we have a, a technology now. We can have uh, multi-missions to the moon. And I think the moon is called the eighth continent. It will be very soon to have a regular trip to the moon. We can go to the moon in a few hours. We can have a colony in the moon. We can have cities in, on the moon. And I expect by, by the end of this decade, 2030, we can have a small city on the moon that can be working to um, investigate the lunar treasure, the mining, the, uh, the special and the very rare material on the moon, which can be like helium-3 or something like this, 
also we have a lot of uranium on the moon. So I think the next investment, especially in space technology, will be uh, having the moon. As you can see, this this picture here, the Earth is already have uh, a lot of satellites orbiting, uh, and this is a crowd. Usually, hum humankind looks to around the environment and see yes, we are sufficient now. We next one, so we have already uh, surveyed the Earth. We by the near uh, space, we have to go to the next step for the space can be deep space missions like a moon and other planets. Um, as you can see here, there is a lot of investigation for how to commercialize the space and how to make a small satellites. You can see here the, the, that the conventional large satellite can be ranging from uh, more than a then and nowadays we can have what we, what we can call a Biko satellites and the satellites. This is a very small satellite actually that can be done and can be implemented in a very fast way and very efficient, cost effective, and also affordable to universities and research centers. And this investigation led us to have a missions to the moon and to the other planets using a cube satellites. I think two, two years ago, we had a mission from NASA called Mars Cube. This Mars Cube is a cube satellite going to Mars. And this is going to have a, a, a double cube satellite, two cube satellites orbiting Mars, and one of them are contacting the Earth, and the other one is investigating the atmosphere or the, um, um, the near orbit of the Mars, So, which is a, a huge investment and a huge step in the world of nanosatellites. Uh, applications and dimensions. As you can see, we have a lot of subsystem light, and we can also divide the uh, satellite systems and space segment and launch segment. Most of the investment is going to the ground segment, and we can call it the downstream. The downstream is having the data coming from the satellite down to the ground station, and what we can do with this data, we have a large amount which is coming from the space now, regarding Earth observation, regarding the satellite uh, orbiting the other planets, regarding satellite positioning and navigation, as well as the weather and forecasting for the uh, solar activity as well, which can have a very, very great impact on the human life. Also, we can have different pillows of satellite regarding the communication system, which you all know. We have a satellite which is dedicated for communication and for television and for broadcasting. And also we can have a GPS satellite which can, we can already use it day by day. Uh, and remote sensing which can be divided to the passive remote sensing as well as well active remote sensing which is a synthetic aperture radar. And we have also right, the original satellite can be uh, both in a large altitude uh, above the earth that can provide us with the motion of the um, um, of the clouds, can make an early warning system uh, for the humankind as well. So, if you look to the satellite bus, which is a very complicated actually, but this is a challenge, and the researchers start to solve these challenges challenge by having a nano satellite system. The nano satellite systems actually is giving to a very important and very uh, recent trend nowadays. It's other satellite subsystem and uh, the composition of each of them. And as we can see here, the of nano satellites. So, so we are now speaking about the era of nano satellites. So we are going from the large satellite down to the nano satellites. With nano satellite, we have the present and the future. The future of the nano satellite is going to be for the space mission in a deep space. Deep space means a lunar mission like. Uh, lunar orbiting and other planets, exoplanets mission, and other planets with nano satellites. Nano satellites nowadays also are very, uh, uh, especially when we have a research which is dedicated how to prolong the time of the nano satellite, the lifetime itself, based on the uh, recent advances and technology, especially when we have uh, effect on satellite subsystems. This radiation effect actually degrades. Nowadays, can uh, see how we can 
improve the performance of smooth satellites and non satellites uh, around the earth uh, one of the most the, and uh, the advantage of the nano satellite is the short development time the short development time can uh, make the, the the feasibility of ha having a constellation and a cluster of nano satellites that can be used for many many applications like imaging like um, edge computing the edge computing actually having a recent trend in in processing you can have uh, a node uh, which in our case is a satellite this node can have a sensor and you can have this sensor uh, equipped with uh, required uh, computational platform so that it can make the processing on the edge on the computer on the node itself and the non-satellite and then you can send you the result and you don't have to receive a lot of data and this actually um, can uh, be uh, work with the limited bandwidth for the communication system uh, um, uh, also, the, the nanosatellites as a constellation minimize the risk. You can have uh, a nanosatellite, a constellation today, is, which is working. Then if one of them is uh, is failed, you can have a, a substitute with a shorter time with uh, advanced. You don't have to build a large satellite. This large satellite can stay in the uh, service with 10 years. And after five years of operation, the technology of this satellite will be obsolete. You need to renew the technology. Satellite, you can't do this, but you can do this if you fractionated the the this large satellite into small satellites and with with many uh, fractionation uh, imaging and surfacing, you can have a, a incremental deployment service which can provide you with state of the art technology as well. Um, I can see here that uh, the commercial market worldwide. Uh, is emerging in specific points satellite and the space technology, especially the software. The software, you don't have to have money. You can have uh, a BC, which you can develop your own software uh, for space systems and non-satellite systems as well. You have a system engineering uh, service as well. A lot of companies is based on the service engineering, uh, system engineering service can be providing for consultancy and other uh, space missions as well. The ground station uh, also uh, image fusion, especially using the artificial intelligence system uh, on board and ground uh, to process and make the result of the um, image received from the satellite. Uh, I will conclude here my presentation by seeing the satellite for the new, new technology here. So uh, nowadays here for space market, we have uh, to have a solution that can be low cost, sustainable, responsive, fast and efficient, and incremental deployment, which is a very important issue here. Uh, also satellite can uh, be relied on the artificial intelligence and machine learning. Machine learning uh, is nowadays one of the state of the art technology that is equipped with the uh, satellite itself. So you can have uh, an, an, a machine learning engine uh, on board. You can have uh, a lot of experience to learn this, uh, this about the data. Then it can give you the result without having any effort or without the, uh, losing or making all resources uh, like computational resources and storage for the satellite itself. So it can be very cost efficient uh, and it can be a very reliable and fast responsive solution for uh, space and satellite technology machines. Thank you. Well, thank you for the amazing presentation. I think you have uh, completely covered the entire uh, you know, space industry. So literally given a space eye view of the entire uh, industry and the subject. So thank you. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. So um, let's uh, go ahead with the Q&A session. So uh, I also invite uh, Aravind to join us. Hi. All right. Hello. OK. So um, we've seen both of your presentations, both of them taking two different approaches, I would say. So uh, Aravind, your presentation on the Earth observation segment was quite insightful. 
And uh, Dr. Ahmed, your uh, presentation literally gave a complete, in a nutshell, how you would describe the industry. It's, it's almost perfect. I'm out of words, actually. So my first uh, question, so let's start with the Q&A. And my first question is directed to uh, Dr. Ahmed. So in your presentation, uh, you had mentioned about uh, upstream and downstream services of the industry. So as I understand, upstream is your launch vehicles, the hardware which actually goes to space. Yes. And the downstream is the data which is being collected from the satellites and which is being used towards uh, various applications. Yes. So mm -hmm. what I would like to ask is, uh, like in the presentation, what uh, Arvind had uh, given, he specifically spoke about very certain uh, bands. I, I, I'm not saying bandwidth, but very specific bands of application, which you're finding either in terms of you know, Earth observations, so you have uh, multispectral or hyperspectral imaging of a certain bandwidth and a frequency, the same with communication. So do you see a disconnect between the type of satellites which are being launched and the downstream services of which are being conceptualized in terms of using these uh, you know, upstream drivers? What I'm asking is whether the upstream is actually influencing the downstream side of things or are the downstream applications actually influencing the upstream side of things? Okay, this is a good question, actually. And I would like to reply with this, uh, that the space systems ecosystem. So the ecosystem here is uh, for the upstream and the downstream. Uh, we have different perspective here. For example, if we are looking to the downstream, most of the investment given to the downstream. So if you see the investment worldwide, you can focus on the downstream. Because a company is building uh, its, uh, its market based on the using of satellite data, not only the images, but also the um, GPS data, the weather data, um, bind all of them uh, by data fusion using artificial intelligence systems. It's amazing results. And this actually does not require a lot of investment, not a required uh, a financial capital. But having an upstream, you have to develop a hardware, which is very expensive, which you have to develop a soft, specific software. Yes, that world is trending now towards the customizability, configurability, and minimizing the, uh, the, the, the software architecture to different missions. Yes, but you have to make the investment. You, have, you need to have a capital investment in, this, in the upstream. For the downstream, yes, it is very linked to the uh, upstream. Uh, because all the investment you have done in the upstream, you have to return on investment in the downstream. So uh, if you are investing one pound here, you have to get one pound and a half in the downstream. And this investment will reflect to the downstream application and the space market regarding all different kinds of application, software, data fusion, artificial intelligence, all this should be linked together in a system which is complete uh, each other. All right, thank you. So essentially I've said that uh, both of them are quite literally complementary to each other, isn't it? Yes, sure. All right, so my next question is to uh, Aravind. And uh, in your presentation, you had uh, mentioned about the Landsat program. So uh, I think we, our viewers would know that uh, Landsat is something which has been going on for the past 20 years. I think it was one of the longest- 50, 50 uh, years. 50 years. So it's one of the longest uh, imaging you know, platforms uh, currently in existence. And we are also seeing private companies like Planet, which is entering the segment with their Dove satellites. So do you see the relevance of bigger uh, government-based uh, satellite projects? Like uh, we have the ISRO, uh, NASA, NASA ISRO mission coming up in the next mm -hmm. one or two years. Yeah. So do you see the relevance for such bigger missions or do you see the private uh, entities completely taking up this space yeah no i think the direct answer is no i don't think uh, the private companies can come in and take that place because they exist for two different reasons um you know the private entities are incentivized by their market and what the market needs and essentially sometimes what the market needs is not what uh science needs 
you know, scientifically, you need to gather different types of data, which is what these missions uh, do. Um, and I can say that from a weather and science perspective, do we have any commercial weather companies at all? Well, we are going to be the first commercial satellite constellation in weather. So everything that's been going on in weather has been only through public agencies. Uh, we can also say everything that we know about climate change from space has been only through public agency missions from Sentinel or Copernicus from Europe and from, you know, the Landsat and the um, GOES programs of, the, of, of, of NOAA. So essentially they exist for two different reasons. And, uh, you know, the scientific part will always continue to be there. Um, and the commercial part will be there, but it can complement it. So that's what Planet is trying to do. So if you look at their recent announcement, last year's announcement, also this year's announcement, they are trying to be, um, you know, they're make, trying to make their products easy to use together with Sentinel data, which is, you know, a public agency missions data. And it's going to probably continue as well. And it's the same case for, uh, I would argue, for all the Indian companies coming up. So Pixel or, you know, anyone else who's about to launch their own satellites, they are going to have to make their, because at the end of the day for your user, um, the public data is free. Uh, it's open data. So they would use start using the for their applications through a public data and planets data will be an addition a complement because the public data is not going to be available every day every hour like what planet is promising but what it does guarantee is scientific accuracy because that's that's the mission objective the mission objective for them is scientific accuracy but for planet the scientific objective is not the mission accuracy but it's about how much the data that they can get can be sold to their customers. So it's very, you know, the, the motivations are very different. So I don't think there's going to be, a, um, you know, there's going to be a, let's say, a conflict or even, a, um, you know, either or between the two. Thank you. I think that uh, sums up everything. So uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, I have a question regarding uh, sensor development. So in uh, Aravind's presentation, we, he had spoken about the iPhone, you know, moment when uh, apps began to take precedence. And I think uh, when you had mentioned about the growth of the private space industry, one of the things that we keep hearing about is COTS, commercially off the shelf uh, components. And uh, this has been driving a lot of uh, nano satellite missions because suddenly you could just uh, open the internet and you could find, uh, you can build your own satellite. So it's come to that place where uh, anybody can uh, you know, work out a constellation and do it. So in terms of uh, sensor development, which is available commercially, uh, could you just speak a bit about the recent trends and where do you see this is transitioning in the next few years? Okay. Uh, uh, regarding the sensor and um, payload of the space mission, as you can see, uh, if you are uh, a researcher or a professor in a university or a researcher in some research center, you can go online. You can have some website. There is a lot of websites. You can see, um, build your CUBE satellite. Regarding the mission, it, uh, it will be complicated actually to have a very precise commercial of the shelf complete solution for your payload. I mean, if you are going to have a camera, you have to define your resolution, your spectral band, your dramatic resolution as well. Uh, if you have a specific purpose, most probably we can't find the commercial of the shelf payload sensor. On the other hand, there is another missions like measuring the space plasma, for example, uh, which can be existing in the ionosphere. It's a very complicated mission, very scientific mission, and you will never find a ready-made quartz component for this. You have to develop your own sensor. And this is why it comes a role of search groups. You have to build your own payload, specifically specific mission. But on the other hand, there is some, some trends, the emerging and developing space country that you are going to build your Q not for a purpose, but no, but you are going to build them for technology demonstration. And this one, you are seeking another objectives. You are seeking to build your heritage, to develop your team, to build your capacity. Maybe the human capacity, maybe the hardware capacity. So in this situation, you cannot find, uh, or you cannot uh, 
be uh, obliged to a specific payload. You can find any payload, you can build your uh, complete solution. In this trend, you are searching for a low cost and fast and very efficient solution, which you find on the market. On the other hand, there's a lot of uh, sensor development, hyperspectral imaging, spectral also for the far infra infrared. Because these spectral bands on the camera system provides observational researchers and commercial companies with a lot of data that can be uh, investigated and can be emerged with the artificial and you can combine a lot of data from hyperspectral, from SAR, from RGB camera to have a lot of data and then you can fuse them together. You can find a lot of results you never can find by your own eye. Is here what comes the magic of having different sensors and uh, complete uh, different source of data. But in this, you have to be very careful during the measurement because having a hyperspectral data for a certain site uh, and you have a SOAR with a certain with this uh, same, but in a different imaging condition, in a different altitude, in a different weather condition, it gi can give you a lot of fake results. So you have to have a very careful uh, image fusion techniques as well. This is for the Earth observation systems. Also, we have uh, many uh, missions, especially for the exoplanets. You can find uh, many uh, of the uh, missions going to the Mars. And most of them uh, to study the weather of the Mars and the climate variables in the atmosphere, or we can say the uh, the the surrounding of the Mars surface, which can be investigated in, in the far future for can you, the human be live in this. This actually requires a very specific, uh, very specific development of a very specific sensors. And here we come to the contradiction between having uh, to invest um, uh, very specific research to produce only one type of this sensor that can be used for only one mission and to have the investment. This is usually the uh, private companies do not do. So you can find only the agencies. You can find NASA, you can find United Emirates investment. This is a country investment for a strategic vision. So you have a political well here. You can have the, the, the investment and you don't look to the return on investment. So it, uh, objectives here. So I think the uh, sensor uh, market is emerging one, and uh, it is you, you have to uh, precisely allocate yourself if you are going to make an investment for a specific mission or you are going to make a sensor development for a worldwide market. Thank you. I think it covers it uh, really well regarding having the required political will, the investment and also to complement that with technological innovation. Yes. So my next uh, question is directed to both of you. Uh, so I need both of your perspectives on this. So Kessler syndrome is something which has been in the news lately and uh, with the growing number of satellites, which are you know, planned to be launched in the next uh, 10 years, I keep reading reports, some suggest 10,000, some suggest 50,000, <laughs> but 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 the question but the problem is very much apparent that when you are launching so many satellites at a specific orbital plane there is always the risk of you know satellites colliding with each other and and there are not many i believe legal frameworks which actually penalize an operator in case uh, there is collisions within the low earth orbit so my question is twofold what is being done to on in the on the legal and the political level to actually prevent the overcrowding of the low Earth orbit? And the second question is, what are some interesting uh, technological uh, demonstrators which are being planned to clean this space? Uh, maybe I can go first quickly and uh, let uh, I mean compliment. So, uh, well, first thing, what's going on is uh, there's a lot of companies that are trying to solve this so on two two ways right like one to monitor it to see actually how bad is it because we need to understand that because we've been saying it's bad and bad but we need to see how bad we have some data from public sources from the u.s air force for instance uh well space force now um to monitor some you know 
big debris, but then for the very, very, very small ones, uh, we need more radars. So there's a company called Leo Labs that's looking into it. So that's uh, that's very, very good because they have radars all around the world or they're expanding their radars. Um, and soon I also know of a few companies that are about to land, launch satellites to monitor it from space in terms of monitoring all the positions of the debris uh, down to small centimeters because those are the ones that can you know, cause a huge problem. I'm sure Amin um, knows and can talk about it. Uh, so that's on the monitoring side and on the removal side as well. So active debris removal. Um, there are companies like Astroscale that are launching missions to, yeah, basically pull the debris down and, you know, down to the atmosphere and burn up. Um, and we are all incredibly hard challenges because you not only have to get the robotics right in terms of the precision and the accuracy to grab the object, but also to, you know, to get the... Well, the, the attitude control and, you know, everything that uh, I'm going to explain in terms of how satellites work, you need to get all of that right. And, you know, there are demonstration missions being launched. There's one in Astroscale in Japan and US, and there's one in Europe called Clear Space. Uh, we've been funded by ESA, and I know that ESA is doing a lot of work on that. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a problem that is, you know, being actively look at, looked at. But, yeah, from the legal perspective, we definitely need regulations sooner than later. Hopefully it comes up soon because we can't keep launching without... Uh, we have guidelines where people have to get it down in 25 years after they launch, but I think it's still too far long, 25 years today. You know, in five years, we have more than a few thousand satellites just in five years. So, and all of them have 25 years in case they don't have mechanisms to get back down. We're talking about tens of thousands with Starlink and Project Kuiper and all the Earth observation satellites. It's, yeah, it's, it's if you don't have the regulation in the next couple of years, it can get bad because we're already seeing effects of it. Like a couple of years back, there was no, inc not no incident, but nothing in the news. But in the last years, we've already seen, oh, this satellite had to take a, you know, take a, um, they had to control the, the orbit of this satellite. And we did that for the ISS this year. Uh, so it's getting progressively bad, but it's not going to be a matter of time before, you know, it gets crazy. So yeah, sooner than later. Well, <laughs> I, I, I don't think that uh, there will be a near future solution for this problem. Even we have, a, if, if we have a regulation, I don't think also all the, um, the launching company will uh, adopt this regulation. Uh, because um, we have two contradictions here. We have the sense of dangerous that maybe by within 10 or 20 years, we can have a dangerous situation regarding the all the, the earth um, and the other one is looking for the return on his investment you are you build a rocket and you want to launch satellites with uh, with this rocket so uh, you, you want the money so if I come if a, if a company come to you and give you the money and tell you that please launch for me 100 satellites and I will not uh, comply with this regulation I think you will have to uh, to accept once you secure your return on investment, and yes, that's you, you can go a, a bankruptcy. So we, we have we have this uh, we have this uh, contradiction uh, worldwide, uh, especially when we have the private launching, because the private sector in the launching service can can have a lot of freedom to do the um the um, to provide the space access to many many countries with many many also uh space um, space uh, fairing and space merging and assist the developing nations as well but on the other hand we can see a lot of effort for the space debris and this is a very complicated task and i think the technology readiness level for this is very low i think maybe we have trl two or three or something like this. But in order to have a TRL-9, means that you have eyes which go to space and search for the debris and identify the debris and detract the debris and take the debris and put there on another place on the space. And uh, I don't think the technology now is ready to have a reliable in this. But within a few years, if we have a reliable solution, uh, it will be very cost because it is very expensive. Also, it will be uh, very dangerous, because if your system took a, an active satellite, 
what will happen in this situation to make uh, liability uh, you have to be reliable, reliable for the, the the nation of the agency operating this satellite you have to, to pay for the well so i think the, com the complexity of this space debris problem uh, can be can be uh, taken in a serious uh, by monitoring first and um, identifying the, uh, the 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 uh, dangerous and I think uh, we have something like this in NORAD. You can you can alerts by uh, collision probability, and you can have this estimation of probability, which is very accurate also as well. And I can see the emerging. Um, market in space debris removal as uh arvin said that we have a lot of company entering this market but uh, i think this uh, is so late to have uh, to have a reliable solution because uh, a reliable solution will come at a time after uh, we have reached a very dangerous and very uh, very critical situation for space debris that's why i think the humankind now singing to the other and far uh, space mission, deep space mission, uh, uh, a lot of space that can operate your uh, your your freely with uh, very low uh, constraints on uh, space uh, operation. Yeah, and I'd also like to add that you know these are all important problems, and I'd also like to say they are boring problems because people want to launch satellites, people want to work on launchers, uh, people want to even work on you know creating you know newer types of propulsion but tackling debris is like a it's a very boring problem and not a lot of people want to solve it which is unfortunate mm -hmm. but it's it's true but i'm i'm glad that in india for example Dijantara from with anirud and their team they're looking at tackling it and i'm so glad that they they you know companies like them exist because you know they i'm also thinking of it from um from uh, inclusivity and equality, equal access to space perspective, because the West have already launched thousands of satellites. Before, uh, you know, by the time, you know, Africa and India and Latin America, we are ready to launch. Uh, it seems like we won't have access to space anymore, right? Like, because the place is already crowded. So yes. it's, 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 it's also a question of, um, you know, equal access to space. So that's something that, um, talk about and you know we should probably do more about doing that and you know we should not make this another climate change kind of a conversation right mm -hmm. like it's it's it's, it's uh, i think we heard someone speak at a recent event from nasa about how this is very similar to climate change in terms of you know a lot of you know the top two five percent of countries contributed to climate change and then 100 percent of the world has an impact and the same is kind of going on with space and space debris so it's important to think about and i hope that there are more entrepreneurs and you know people looking at fixing it um both from you know monitoring and then once you monitor it also for removal and you know in between whoever is trying to launch has a deorbit system in place uh, i know that one web has it um actively and starlink as well uh, i think has it thousands of satellites um so hopefully they continue to have it as well in the future i think that's a really uh, interesting perspective that you brought in about the you know discrimination between the east and the west uh, mainly to say that uh, i've always felt that these regulations that which are currently being planned and spoken about for instance i think it was the fa which there was a mandate a few years back where specifically they had uh, said that uh, anything below uh, anything above 600 kilometers you would require an active propulsion system yes. to you know, complement your mission so it also makes me wonder whether by the time the uh, you know countries in the east i shouldn't say east i would say east and south from a geopolitical perspective you raise the trl levels to an extent that you are able to you know facilitate your own missions uh, and the policies kick in which uh, in a way would stifle innovation because suddenly you have reached a point where you are not able to launch uh, technically because the entire space is crowded so it's very difficult to get launch clearance to uh, you know, enable your mission and also regulations come in which prevent you know companies from uh, you know investing into more and more uh, you know uh, constellations so do you see this happening anytime soon in the future that we would reach a queue point where you know both the graphs intersect
but you can't actually launch because technically it's uh, quite difficult and uh, legally these <laughs> regulations come in and but I guess uh, just to add uh, the Artemis project, for instance, uh, it's been in the news and you are, we are seeing that we have two accesses, one complementing the Artemis project, saying that it's really good for innovation. But at the same time, you have countries like uh, China and Russia uh, who are saying that it's not really good because well, it also puts... India, India has not signed the Artemis agreement. Yes, yes we didn't. Yes. So it's not, you know, like it's not, you know, beneficial for everybody because you're starting this exclusive club. So do you see the same thing happening, you know, in the next few years in terms of other, uh, you know, segments? Okay, uh, okay, first, okay. <laughs> the issue is here is that we, we don't have a, go uh, a governing agency worldwide. So uh, either you, 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 you take this uh, problem to a political level, like the climate change effect on the planet Earth. So you, you can have a uh, presence of the nations meeting together and like, yes, we have to have this problem in, in common and we have to solve this problem for our humankind. Or you leave it as it is and see what will happen in the future, which can be, yes, the service. You can, you can come and I think this, this can come within a few years, maybe within one decade or something like this. Uh, but this is a very complicated solution and require a lot of agencies, uh, active agencies. I mean, the, the, the agencies which, which have contribution. Uh, by and actually, if you, if you see the climate change issue, you can see here, uh, there is a very major active countries that is the emissions of the CO2 and CH4. On the other hand, you can see also a lot of countries here in the uh, space active players they can issue. Unless these countries cannot agree together to have this in serious situation, uh, I don't think that the other can have um, uh, a reliable solution. All right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Arvind, do you have any points to add to that? Um, well, I I would not be very, very optimistic, but I don't think I should be very pessimistic because we've always found a way um, at the end. And I go back to, like, for example, the ozone layer. You know, we knew that there was a problem and then somehow we came together and we had the... Um, was it the Kyoto Protocol? Um, yes, I forgot. Um, 1992. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, came together to fix it and, you know, uh, banned the chemical. So uh, when we stand at a disaster, I think um, we can kind of come together and fix it. But unfortunately, people are not able to visualize the disaster, right? Like it's the same with climate change. It's the same with... Uh, space debris, you know, you have various visualizations that show how bad it's going to be, but um, it's still not enough. Maybe we need to see a lot more. I think, um, yeah, maybe there's going to be a couple of incidents that's going to, especially to commercial operators, right? Like if it happens to commercial constellations that the company will go bankrupt, right? Like if those some satellites don't exist. So if, if, if when that happens, I think that's when, but we don't need to wait that long. That's that's my perspective. Like so, we will. I think we will try and fix it in terms of either removing the debris or you know regulating what we launch and why we launch. Um, but yeah, that point will probably need to come sooner, and we don't need to wait for you know the couple of companies to realize that their satellites are down. And uh, and I hope that it doesn't happen to any of the. Uh, you know, going back to the question about public agency satellites, they are so, so important and people don't realize it. It's, it's the, all these agency satellites from NASA to ISRO to ESA to, I'm sure, the, um, the agencies, uh, you know, the Egyptian Space Agency and every space agency around the world. There, I hope that it doesn't happen to any public mission because the, the implications of that are going to be bad. Because if it's a private company, they can go ahead and raise the money and launch a satellite again. We've already seen that happen, you know, a couple of companies launched satellites, their satellites uh, didn't launch because the launcher exploded. But those companies were going were able to go back and raise money 
and make the satellites and launch again. But with public money, it's hard, right? Like if you are a politician and you know, you're trying to create a space program and then you just lost your satellite, either because of debris or because of launch. And in this case, if you are to assume it's debris, you know, there's going to be questions asked. Do we need to continue investing in these satellites? Because what if there is another problem? But those satellites, you know, as both of us talked about, are so important for us. And I hope that, yeah, we can continue to spread the message about how important satellites are, because sometimes I am very disappointed that as an industry, we just talk about space tourism and launchers and not about satellites and their applications enough. Um, so that's why I'm, you know, happy to be, you know, part of this one and uh, where we can spread the message to people. Thank you. So I hope uh, I can uh, have both of your time for another 10 minutes, if, if, that, if that's okay. I have five minutes and I need to jump. I'm yes, sorry about that. Yeah. for me, yes. All right, so two quick, two quick questions. So one was a presentation where uh, you had showcased the uh, imaging capabilities of planet where with 30 centimeter uh, you know resolutions you can uh, i mean obviously count containers on ships oh so well, i guess uh, that was planets is yeah. different but yeah that was not planet yes. planet is more three meter uh, and now 70 centimeter so hmm. all right i remember there was a photo which i had seen last year where uh, there was a photo of a chinese warship which was photographed by one of these uh, satellites and it created quite the storm so with all these talks about weaponization of outer space and you know the space force coming in, do you think the private? So again, uh, I think in, when India was testing out its you know nuclear weapons, uh, they evaded uh, you know American surveillance. But now I guess with so many people coming in, is there a risk that private companies would actually fall into the hands of the government players in terms of complying for the military needs? Because ultimately, space is run by a lot of of these defense contracts. And the last question, I mean, is that as somebody who is wanting to come into the industry, we only hear about launch, launch, launch. I mean, the excitement that, you know, rocket launches or, you know, satellites carry. But in terms of the other downstream applications, how do you think that somebody with an interest in law or, you know, somebody who, with an interest in electronics, I mean, various interdisciplinary domains, how do you think that we can better be aware of the developments and you know, contribute towards it? So... Sorry for the long question, but in the you know short span of time, let's try to cover these two things. Sure. Over to uh, you guys. I'll, I'll quickly give my answer. The first one on the military side, I don't think it's going to be, I don't know if we need to worry about that. Maybe Eman um, might disagree, but I don't think because the market's evolving, defense is not the only customer today. There are other country, companies and industries starting to use satellite data directly, you know, not indirectly and not free data, but as commercial companies, their business cases are based on companies of different sectors. So, yeah, I don't think the privatized, sorry, the privatization falling into the hands of defense should be a worry. Although, having said that, I think the space is probably the only industry that I know is so uh, interlinked with geopolitics than any other industry. Um, it's everything that we do in space has an implication even today you talk about private space but you know private space is is uh, powered by public money most of the cases right so even for launch you know the biggest customers have usually been uh, companies either contracted to sell whatever they're launching to the government or the governments themselves so governments have a key role to play so it's it's not far fetched to think of that future although i don't think it's going to be that future so that's on the first question on the second question well i mean you can take my example i did not study anything to do with space i am not a space engineer and i know i have learned as much as possible over the years but i don't know you know the technical details of i know what subsystems are i know i know how power works so i know the you know the fundamentals but i don't know anything in depth so um, you know, and I worked in software and I got into the industry and I moved into the business side of things. So I'm, I was in consulting and I was doing consulting for a lot of companies, um, strategy consulting. So you can enter um, space. Space is the most multidisciplinary domain that I know. Again, it is the most geopolitical and also the most multidisciplinary. So whatever your background is, I think... Uh, I think I even, you know, left a challenge to a few people like, yeah, come to me with like... Uh, 
things that you want to do and I can kind of link it to space. So it can be architecture, it can be just, you know, art uh, to anything that is hard tech to pharmaceutical. Yeah, of course, you know, you need to understand space medicine. Space medicine was one of my favorite topics when I was, to, you know, doing a course at International Space University because I had no idea about how the human body functions. And, you know, not only that, but also now, if you need to start making drugs in microgravity, you know, that's something we did not touch upon uh, in space manufacturing is also, you know, starting to be possible. So when you start to make drugs in space, you know, we can't do that. Engineers can't do that. Space people cannot do that because we don't know anything about medicine, right? You need medical people to be involved. And the same with the building a habitat. Do you really want an engineer to build your space station? Yes, but not from a you know look point of view. You want artists to contribute to that, to real architects, right? Like civil engineers. So yeah, I think any industry has a, play, a role to play in, in space. So yeah, I think my challenge is still open. Like if you want any um, role, I will try and see what, I can, what you can do in space or at least try and find probably not find a job but you can definitely do a research project or two it can be law in anything so yeah that challenge is still open <laughs> thanks okay uh, I, I will respond in a couple of minutes um, because short of the time okay first for the first I think uh, if we sign if we think about the um, story of the internet so it started in a the military and then it come to the government private sector. I think the same will be the space. The space started military applications with two power uh, uh, world competition. We have the Russia, we have the United States competing to get space. Then we have the, a lot of gov governmental entities world think about the space. So how we have a lot of nations that created their agency to enter the space. Then recently, we have the private sector in the space. So this is a traditional way how the industry, not space industry, I mean any industry go. You come from the innovation, the innovation, the idea, the market need. And then take the, the, uh, the initiative, spread uh, around the people. Then the government makes something like creating the needs. They are creating the need for this. We are needing the air internet, we are needing the space applications. Then when we have a lot of market needs, we go to the private sector because the government cannot do everything in the life. Uh, rely on the private sector. And the private sector then is getting to commercialize his products, his even service or um, products, I mean hardware products, like the upstream, which is the hardware, which is the downstream, which is the service. So I think this is very traditional to have the military, then the government, uh, com commercial and the private sector. Uh, for the second question, I think, uh, yes, I agree with Arvind, yes. Well, well, everything um, is well in space. So when you have a space now is a new era. So if you are going to analyze the moon, you will have a colony in the moon, you will have a community, human community in the moon. So you will need everything. You will need the engineer pharmacist, the medical staff, you will meet the arts, everything you can uh, be made uh, in space. So not only the engineering is, it started with the engineering to build a satellite. Then after the satellite, we have the space station. Space station means a lot of experiment, agriculture, biomedical, medicine, pharmaceutical, everything. When you have a community, you have human life. Human life requires a lot of demands. You, then it will be uh, increasingly. Uh, and, and I think in the near future, we will, will we have a colony on the moon, we will have a life on the moon, in the moon. Everything will be trans translated from the Earth to the space, especially the uh, space construction, the medical care, the agriculture, how to create uh, a food, how to sustain your life on the moon. This will be the challenge in the next decade. Thank you. I think that uh, I think it was a very uh, enlightening and informative discussion. And I think the key takeaway is this, that space is the new era. So uh, before this presentation even begun, I literally struggled to speak both of your intros. 
because because they were really impressive regarding all that achievements that you both had and i wish both of you the very best and i look forward to seeing you again in another session so over to uh, namana to take over the session thank you thank you Uh, thank you so much, Arun. I would like to thank both the speakers for such a wonderful session on the past, present, and future of satellites. Also, I would like to thank Arun for flawlessly moderating the session. Thank you, Arun, for giving a good amount of knowledge of how the space exploration got the thrust after the image of Earth being captured from the moon. It was very good to learn about how the Apple developed their iPhones and update it with the new apps. Cloud solution, artificial intelligence, and data fusion actually seems to, the, to be the future of satellites, which we are keenly waiting for. It was cool to know about the different kinds of satellites in the present day and their applications from Dr. Ahmed. Satellites have definitely become a fundamental part of our life because from weather telecasting to telecommunication, from navigation to safety, satellites have occupied our lives invisibly. Especially the Starlink satellites have been a game changer in this modern time. Proceeding further, let me share my screen. Yeah, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude for our sponsor, that is Genex Space. Genex Space is an edtech company dedicated to creating and providing high quality all around space education and services for students and institutions. Formed with the key takeaways of SSERD, a space education and outreach NGO, GenX Space is committed to igniting curiosity and preparing the young generation for this space age to solve significant challenges of our time with the help of space science and technology. We aim to educate and guide curious young minds to achieve their space dreams with space institutions, startups, organizations, companies, and professionals. We request you to go check out the courses provided by GenX Space at www.genx.space. I would also like to thank our official merchandise sponsor, that is The Space. The Space is an ISRO official merchandise store. I personally prefer merchandises related to ISRO as they are a source of inspiration to me always. Got plans to buy any merchandises? Then visit thespace.com to order your cool set of merchandises. Sailing back in time, we can see that we have covered most aspects of space, such as why space, a journey from Big Bang to dark matter, on exoplanets and astrobiology, rocket science, and also satellites. But something is yet to fill the gaps. So on 16th of October, 2021, that is tomorrow, we have three speakers on the panel for the talk on entrepreneurial endeavors. The first speaker is Remco Timmermans, who is a business analyst and a social media specialist for space. The second speaker is Martinez Fedotovas, who is a science communicator at Space Explorer. And the third speaker is Valentin Benoit, who is the founder and CEO of RIDE. I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to Nikita for giving me and Devinder an opportunity to host this event. At SSCRD, we also offer internships on various topics, such as propulsion system, astronomy, and astrophysics, satellites, space settlement, and space mission design. For more information and for registrations, please visit our website, that is www.sscrd.org. Thanks for supporting us by joining us today. And also, I would like to thank all the audience for posting in such amazing questions. Please join us tomorrow for it and other exciting session. Till then, take care. Thank you.